Good morning, beloved. Welcome Tuesday morning. What are we, episode 056? Incredible, they just keep stacking up, stacking up. Well, spring is definitely here. We're supposed to be in the 70s today, and that was after receiving snow last week. So I'm very excited. I lost the hoodie today, down to the jean jacket. We're gonna be in summer clothing here before long. Mrs. W was putting away her winter gear, getting the spring stuff out. We might as well get the worst part over with. The lighting of the lantern. All right. So yesterday I ignored all the advice of the peanut gallery telling me how I should and should not light the lantern. And of course we achieved almost perfect success. So we're down to the 20 pumps. I expect today is going to go, is going to be the best ever. We don't need no stinking white gas. We just burn the cheap stuff. Okay. Are you ready? Here we go. I saw some chatter in the comment section uh, regarding the radios. Where are the radios? When, when, when are we going to have the radios? I, I told you guys last week it's going to be three weeks or so. I haven't seen mine yet. But they will be coming. As soon as I, 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 will, as soon as I have them in my hot little hands, I will be sharing them with you. Oh, good. Oh. You see, this, this is exactly why... This is exactly why I have to focus on the task at hand. Look at what we've done. I've, sp I've got gas everywhere. Of course. Of course. I don't know why I do this. You know, there, it, it, Mr. Rogers, you know, he started his show by putting on a sweater, tying his shoe. Look at this. Goodness. Tying his shoe, changing his shoes. Never once was he spilling gas threatening to light himself in the shop on fire. Now, we, now it's too full. This lantern is getting my goat. Oh, and this building's not over, I assure you. Oh, goodness. Is it asking too much to have a sight window, Coleman? Can you not give us a sight window or at least a fuel gauge? Oh. This, we, we're not off to a good start. We've, we're already deep into the struggle stream. Oh. I don't know what it is, gentlemen. There's two things in life that I have not been gifted with. One is a sense of direction, which plagues me daily. And the two is the spilling of fluids. I was changing the oil on my... We have to focus on what we're doing here. The, the smell of vapor... I'm going to have to get rid of that apple box. It's just, it's, we're going to have to just get, do it the old, old way here. 20 pumps. Guess who I got an email from yesterday? Rolo Tomasi. Who knows who Rolo Tomasi is? He's a YouTuber. There is gas everywhere. This is such a bad idea. You know, I should know better. Filled with anxiety right now. Come on, come on, okay. Curse you.
Okay, I think we're I think we have it, gentlemen. Yes, it was plugged up. Okay, okay, come on. Okay, cross your fingers. Now you guys let me, if this goes out behind me, let me know immediately, please. Also, I have to meet up with Mrs. W in town, so we absolutely cannot go beyond 2 o'clock today. 2.15. 2.15 is the latest. Okay. All right. So, received a couple emails. Uh, one of them from Rolo Tomasi. Rolo Tomasi is uh, one of the original, uh, I guess, the, one of the OGs of the, of the Manosphere. I don't know that he goes back as far as, like, um, Barbarossa or um, Thinking Ape, I don't, but he's been in it for a long time, and he's got a, I think he has a pretty popular podcast or YouTube channel. I've watched a few, a few of his things. He's an old boomer like me, but, old, but, old, but even older. But he asked me to be on his podcast. My, mis my initial thought is, I don't want to be on that podcast. I don't know that I want to get involved with that traditional manosphere. I'm going to have to think about that. Let me know what you think on that. Do you know who Rolo Tomasi is? Would that be a good call or should we avoid it at all costs? I'm thinking we should probably not do it. I, I don't know. I, I get nervous about these collabs. You know, you know, you never know what the motivation of it, of someone is. You know, are are they? You know, once you once they have your content or they record it, you know, they can chop it up and do it and put it in any way you want. And you know, I just don't know. I don't know these guys well enough to to commit to something like that. Plus, you know what? To be honest with you, doing online collaborations where you're doing like a two screens or zoom meetings you know those are just not that great really where the magic comes in and I would be much more inclined to do that sort of thing if we could go and meet face to face it's really something else something completely different when you get to talk to someone sit next to them meet them kind of see their facility see what's going on and it just makes for a much more interesting interview I, I don't know that I like these remote things I, I don't think that that's the best way to go Okay, let's jump into it. Let's see what's going on. We have a super chat from Berserker Gang 2019. Howdy. Hope all is well. Welcome. Welcome. Very happy to have you as well. So, for those of you guys who are members, now remember tomorrow, or following along with us, tomorrow is our fast day. Wednesday. So, that will be 24 hours. So, from the moment we wake up, we're not going to be eating any food, just drinking some water for that 24 hour period. So I like to give you guys a heads up. Sometimes that could sneak up on you and you wake up and you realize after breakfast, oh yeah, we're supposed to do that. So make sure you drink plenty today, plenty of liquid, get your food in and know that we will all be doing this together. We have a super chat from Almost Homesteading. Our, oh goodness, our good friend Almost Head Homesteading and we're gonna give a, Might be nice. look at that, we got the sound drop back. Shout out to you who writes any shortwave Radio recommendations, thank you. I do have one. Would you allow me, let me grab mine. Now, I'm not the radio dude. I, I mean, those, I don't geek out on this stuff, but when I bought mine, I was looking for something that had really high ratings, ratings that had a lot of battery options, very versatile, that I could use in lots of different environments. Shortwave, if you don't know, it's a band. You know, we have AM and FM radio, and then there's shortwave, which uh, gives you the ability to, to listen to stations really, really far away. When I was a boy, I always fell asleep with a radio on. A radio on. I had a little clock radio that my parents got me for my birthday so I could wake up and go to school. Uh, it had a little AM FM radio on it, and I got, to use, I got used to, when I was just little, start listening to talk radio. AM radio, mostly, and um, local radio and such. And what I got into a little bit, I, my second radio I had had a shortwave band on it. So let me grab mine, and I'll show you why I like it and why, I, why you might want to consider getting one yourself. One of the worst things that can happen to you is to be out of communication, not knowing what's going on, you know, being in the dark. You take that for granted with the whole world at your fingertips on the Internet. You hear a rumor about something. You hear something's going on here, going on in France. You know, all you have to do is jump on, type, type in 
your search query and you have access to all this information. You know, put your mind at rest, right? Well, you just have a basic idea what's going on, or we think we do. If the truth was known, probably more than three quarters of what we hear is, is either spun propaganda or deliberately inten intended to mislead, to lead us down a particular path. I would have this, something like this, if you can find something used or a new one. This is a, a little shortwave radio. Now, if you were in the dark, if the internet went down, cell phones went down, how would you get in information? How would you, do you even have a terrestrial radio? This was, I mean, apart from your car and such, but this was common, you know, long ago, back in the day. Everyone had radios in the room, but this is not used too much anymore. We rely upon the internet. We stream everything, uh, but once that's gone, you don't really have access to information. So I, I always, it seemed to me it would be a good idea to have a terrestrial radio. Th this little one here is awesome. A beautiful little piece in a, a good value. It's made by Tech, Tech Sun. It's a overseas. It's not, you know, Motorola or anything, but it's a really high quality item with a lot of nice features. This reminds me of my granddad's old equipment. How often do you see something that comes wrapped in a leather bag? <laughs> That's kind of, kind of quaint, isn't it? It reminds me of my granddad's old camera. Granddad had one of those old cameras that uh, you look down through the top at and it had a, the leather cover on it. Yeah, it was just, times were so much different than those days. I, he, he wasn't a photographer, but he would only bring, he'd bring out his camera once a year. I only saw it once a year and that was at the end of the hunting trip. He wanted to have pictures of all of the guys and all of the antlers of the deer and elk that we got and he would get that camera out and I'd never forget get everyone to line up by the truck and everybody holding up their antlers and he'd look down at that thing and take a picture and it's 30 I think it was 35 millimeter or whatever it was but it had a cover just like this but these little radios are awesome because they give you lots of options okay well for those ham radio guy he can go crazy on this he can geek out till till the cows come home but you've got your regular antenna right uh, you've got your adjustability, but you've also got a fine adjustment. So when you're really trying to d dial in those frequencies that are a long ways, especially at night. Shortwave is really fun to listen to at night because you'll be amazed how far you can pick up frequencies from all over the world, America. I don't remember all the stuff I used to listen to. But one nice little feature on this is it comes with a, um, a great poster here. You know, a company that takes the time to provide nice little details like this, like a, a starter guide, you know, with all of your key functions on it. Isn't that nice? That's a quality item right there. And then this has all your, your amateur radio world map on the back. I thought that was, that was kind of cool. Now, do I know how to use any of this? Of course not. It doesn't make it, no, doesn't make it any less cool, does it? And then inside you've got your um, external antennas, uh, earphone, all that stuff. What really appealed to me about this little Texan is the way you could charge it. This runs off of an 18650 battery, which is the common battery that many of us have on our tactical flashlights and stuff. This, this kind of is the in vogue battery of late. Look at that right there. So that's going to run a long time on that. Whatever you get, just make sure it has a common battery, something you can recharge. And then the radio is a recharger itself. So just by plugging in a USB port to this or a wall outlet, you have, uh, you effectively will recharge the battery inside and then you can lay it back there. But I've always, I've always loved radio and talk radio and I thought this was a kind of neat thing. I always traveled with one when I was on the road. I liked to, it was an alarm clock and I guess that was all before internet. Things, things have changed. Things have changed, but I think it's a good idea to have a shortwave radio. Just, oh goodness, just so you can kind of keep up on what's going on. This was the one that I really liked when I was looking at them. Good price, good radio, should have in the kit, definitely. Okay. All right, where are we at here? Let's jump in here. So we have Berserker Gang. Almost Homesteading and Blue Collar Spartan 92. Shout out to you, Blue Collar. Blue Collar writes, any shortwave... Oh, already got that one. Sorry. He goes on to say, of the 66 books, do you have a favorite? I just started reading Proverbs, have really been enjoying it. So what he's talking about, what Blue Collar Spartan's talking about, 
is uh, the 66 books. Now, we've had some disagreements with our Catholic friends about, wait, what are you talking about 66 books? There's, there's more than 66 books in the Bible. Well, there is in your Bible, but there isn't. It, it's generally understood that the 66 books, as we have in, you know, minus the Apocrypha books, is the canon. It is the original. Now, the Catholics also have what they call the Apocryphal books, which would be like um, the Maccabees, um, the Book of Enoch, I believe. I, I read them some, it was a long time ago, but they're not, they've never been considered to be part of the original. Interesting to read, but when you get into it, you'll find out for yourself, regardless of what anyone says, once you read it and you compare it with the 66, you'll see that it is indeed not on the same level. Interesting for reading, maybe give you a little bit of insight as to a little bit of historical references, but there's also some crazy outlandish things in there as well. I remember something about um, one of the books covers Jesus' early life, which the Old Test the New Testament speaks nothing of. We don't know anything about his early life uh, except for what we find in the Apocrypha books, and it's pretty outrageous. Um, there was something about um, him making birds out of mud and getting even with some boys that were taunting him, and then it was either Peter or John was having some trouble with bed bugs, and through the power of the Holy Spirit, he ordered the bed bugs to march away. You know, So it's, it's some pretty crazy stuff that is obviously a, a, a not considered to be, by true theologians, a part of the 66. With that being said, what is my favorite... You know, what, what I've really been enjoying lately, is, as I'd have to agree with you, is the, the Proverbs. The Proverbs are so interesting, especially when you read them in light of today's particular, of the war of the sexes. Really, that's really what's going on right now. There's a lot of wars going on between people. There's a lot of cultural friction right, right now between black and white, uh, between countries, uh, between men and women. Um, even between parents and kids. Um, COVID has come and brought a big dividing sword uh, between a lot of us as well. So there's a lot of more conflict now and just personal relationship struggles and difficulties, consternation than I've ever remember seeing before. I don't remember people having so much trouble getting along. And it's very interesting in the light of this, these current times to read the Old Testament, the Proverbs, and you see common problems that were common to men. <laughs> that the, the ancient man, the oriental man, back in the day, suffered from the same difficulties uh, that we do uh, with relationships with our women. And there's very little thing, very little that has changed. It, it is just, it's, um, it's quite, you know, we think that we're so progressive and we think we've moved on and we've learned so much and we're so much more advanced in every way than the ancient peoples. But when we go back and read those Proverbs and we see the problems that men were having with women in those days are nothing new. Uh, everything today, well, there's nothing new under the sun, as King Solomon said. But I have to say that I'm with you on that, that I have been enjoying the Proverbs. You know, the Holy Scriptures are very interesting in that we're told that spiritual things are spiritually discerned. And that the gospel or anything contained in the books, if read or tried to, if tried, if the non-believer or the heretic tries, to, not the heretic, but the non-believer, the pagan tries to read these things and and discern some some sort of insight, it, it's oftentimes it doesn't happen that spiritual things are spiritually discerned. And what makes the the good book so much different than anything else is that I could never go back and reread, or there's very few novels or books that I could read twice. So there have been a few. There, there's a handful that I have enjoyed twice, but I don't know that I've ever enjoyed one three times, uh, and certainly not any more than that, where the good book is very different. And it's amazing that you could read a scripture, or read through a passage or a book, or something that you have gone over a thousand times um, and never really got anything from it, or it didn't really speak to you, or it wasn't a wasn't applicable to the problems or, or struggles that we're having today. And then all of a sudden you'll go back and reread it and you'll get an insight or revelation that you never saw before. I have had so many aha moments where I'll come across something. It could be a word or just the end of a sentence or a paragraph where I just sit back in my chair and I just marvel. Like how many times have I read this and I never saw this? God continues to open your eyes and give you what you need to give you what you need. 
and it, it never gets old and, and that's what we feed off. We feed off that word and that's how he communicates with us. And having that record of history, having that record of how God deals with man on a day-to-day -day basis is very encouraging to us. Because if we were to look at the patriarchs, those, those heroes of faith back in the day, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David, Solomon, Gideon, Samson, right, to, to name a few, if they did not suffer under the human condition that we do, it would be very discouraging. It would be a very discouraging book to read because you would always feel that, oh, I, I can never meet that standard. I could never match up to the, to the heroes of the Bible. But what we find there is just the opposite. We find real people, real people, real problems, real stories that we can relate to. They're relatable to us. And always, you know, when you're reading this, especially as someone that's a, a person of the book, it's been around the block a time or two, I challenge you to, to go back and to reread or pick up where you're at right now and answer this one question. What is what I'm reading? What does that tell me about the character of God? Let's not be, we have a, we have a tendency to focus on our own particular problems. You know, you you think you're the center of the universe and woe is me and my difficulties and my struggles and my problems and lose the big picture. You know, what has God done for me lately? Well, the question is, what have you done lately? What have you done for the gospel lately? And, and what's so encouraging about those old stories is, is we see these men that, that fell, that were, had every possible advantage, or you would think they had every advantage. I mean, let me ask you a question. Those of you who struggle with faith or are agnostic or sitting on the fence and just don't know, need proof, need, need evidence. There are many stories that, where God actually showed up in person, spoke to these men. You know, the good book tells us God spoke to Abraham face to face as a man speaks to his friend. And, and it, I marvel at it every time I reread it. Is, is Abraham even argued with God even got God to change his mind on different things. And there's many occasions of that. And it's really an astonishing thing when you think about it, because you can look at God being high and lofty and the creator of all things, spoke matter into existence, and then you see yourself, how small you are, and it's like comparing a giant to an ant, an, an insignificant ant. And yet the creator of the universe comes down and has a conversation with mankind face to face as it's put, as a man speaks to his friend. That's an incredible thing, isn't it? What an incredible amount of respect God shows his children to, to, to come down, to lower himself, and, and, come, and to deal with our particular problems, to have a concern about things that matter to us. You know, the good book tells us that there's not a, a, a little bird, the smallest bird that, that falls to the earth, frozen or dead from old age, that God isn't aware of. He never designed this earth to be filled with competitiveness, with, with death, um, with um, the savagery of the animal kingdom. This was all, all comes upon us uh, as a result of sin. This was never the ideal. It would be a horrible thing to think. I mean, if you were going to just focus on, you know, the good book tells us that all of creation speaks to the glory of God. And if you were going to take that a step further and say, okay, well, let's look at the animal kingdom. Let's look at the, the cat that sadistically toys with the mouse, that doesn't put it out of its misery, but chomps and severs its spine so the mouse has to crawl around on front legs and doesn't put it out of its misery, but continues to torment it. And can you imagine that, what that's like? And uh, the savagery of the animal kingdom of the cheetah and the gazelle and such, you know, is that, are these the things that speak to the glory of God? You know, if that's the way that it was, and that's the way, the way that he ran his kingdom, uh, the savagery of, nat of nature, um, man, I would, be a terror, I would be scared stiff of a God like that. But all of these things are a result of our separation from him. This was never the plan. Never the plan. So remember that, beloved. When you see how cruel the world is, you know, the good book tells us the whole earth groans under the burden of sin, groans and travails under the burden of sin. We're not the only one that's affected by all these problems. I'm reminded of that every time I see an animal on the dead on the side of the road, that this was never, never the plan. But here we are, and we have to endure so that we don't have to be here 
um, longer than possible. Mr. William Cordell, member for Two Bunch and Super Chat. Shout out to you, William. William says, is daily refu- refueling required for the lantern? Couldn't you just run it empty, then refuel the fire hazard? Yes, I could. I could. But, um, but I don't. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> yeah, no, well, it depends. Sometimes, yes. Sometimes after the live stream, I will, um, I'll, I'll leave and go do something else uh, and turn it off. But usually I'm in here working or doing another project or some fixing or fixing something around here. And I'll have the lantern with me. I like that light from the lantern. And so um, sometimes it runs many hours, sometimes it doesn't. So I always forget where the fuel's at. But yes, if I was smart, I would probably do that. But, but then we wouldn't have the potential for a fire on, on live uh, YouTube. And, and then what fun will that be? Thank you, brother, for that. We have a super chat from Nodel, Nodello Nate. Shout out to you, to Nodello. First time super chatting, but I've always wanted to tell you how much I appreciate your rec- you. Recently got a truck canopy and you, and you, my CRF 230 running because of you. The CRF 230, man, that is, well, you have, to, you have a problem right there. The problem with the canopy and why I don't have a canopy is because you can't put a motorcycle in the back. Uh, and that's always a problem. Uh, but the 230 is a great bike. Yeah, if you're if you're looking at a starter bike, and you're if you're not super tall, you know, that's something to consider. One thing that intimidates a lot of dudes with dirt bikes is the uh, is they're so tall. And I know women really suffer with that. Um, it's intimidating. It's kind of scary to get on this fire breathing machine with all this horsepower when you can't touch the ground. That's a hard thing to get your head around. So there are some bikes that are that are good starters and that 230 is a real good option. It's an intermediate bike that's a, a good where to, place to start if you've never been on a motorcycle before where you can, um, it's not too tall. Uh, you can get your feet down over it, you can throw a leg over it. Uh, just a very nice mild engine, a good low first gear, good for tractoring and a, 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 fun, a fun bike to ride. You know, the little bikes are so fun to ride. They really are. You just get, guy needs to get his ego out of it. I would, to be honest with you, I, I had a, well, probably yesterday, I took off um, after the live stream and I went out and went for a ride by myself. It was supposed to be an hour and it turned into about five hours and I got in at about nine o'clock at night last night because it, everything, it was just, everything was clicking. It was just such a nice time. It was a solo ride. Uh, I was up exploring around to the east side of the mountain and, and I just was, you just get in so, the zone and I've never had a better time on a motorcycle and I was thinking you know keep thinking about bigger bikes bigger bikes what how would I improve upon this the 300 is just about ideal that 250 300 size is very nice it has all the power you're going to want on the trail it's got the bottom end get you out of trouble if you go into something in the wrong gear and it's light enough you know 210 220 pounds that you can pick it up drag it across the stream I like a lightweight, small enduro bike, the 250s, 300s. I really think that's where it's at. It, 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 you just have so much fun on it. We have a super chat, and, and shout out to you, Nadello Nate. Congratulations on the canopy and getting you 230 going. Getting you 230 going. Mr. Northern Man, member for two months. Shout out to you, Northern Man. Come on now. Happy nay! He says, I know it's missing power, but I'm rebuilding my dad's old 1977 Honda XL100. Man, that's totally cool, man. There's, not, there's nothing wrong with that. I'll tell you the most fun I've ever had on a motorcycle, and many of you old boomers are going to be able to relate to this, was the old Honda, the 110. I think it was. Was it a 110 or a 125? It's the classic. It's got the step-through frame. doesn't have a top bar, you know, kind of like a girl's bike. I remember when I was uh, 10 years old, oh, it was one of the greatest three days of my life. My granddad's brother, Speed, they called him. His name was Everett, but they called him, everybody called him Speed. I don't know why. Because he was so late. Maybe it was, mo- maybe it was a play on words because he was, he was the least speedy guy I ever knew. <laughs> he was so laid back and a relaxed guy. But he showed up and he had one of those 110 Hondas. Uh, and he rolled it over and said, oh, I thought you might like to ride this bike because I wasn't old enough to, um, to go out and hunt with the men. So I had to stay, this was deer hunting. So I had to stay at home back behind with, with the women. 
And this, this was normal, you know, what I had to do. I was just a little kid. But this was the first time I'd ever experienced freedom, ever, where I could go wherever I wanted, where no adult could tell me what to do on my very own machine on that little Honda 110. And I rode the wheels off of that thing. I just just take my lunch and would go out at 10 years old and just ride roads and trails all around the camp there and experienced. And that was really where my love of motorcycles came from. I was really hooked after that. And I've, I've loved it ever since. Um, I love that those little bikes. They were just wonderful. Mr. Northern Man. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, don't I, that XL100. You know, my dad had um, a Kawasaki. I wished I would have kept it. That I used to ride. It was a little two-stroke. It was a. Um, it was. A, I think it was a 300, 230, 250. It was just just a little one like that. And you know, it was it was a bike that was an old-fashioned bike, not unlike your 110. I rode that thing all over the road. He would plated it. Uh, there's no reason why you can't do all the things that we're talking about. You can't have a great bug out vehicle with a 100 cc bike. It, there really isn't. It's not about speed uh, for the most part, especially if you're gonna be hauling gear and looking at this as kind of a pack mule or something that you can pack gear around or just get in and out of places fast and easy or throw in the back of your truck as a spare vehicle. There's nothing wrong with those at all. And any one of you guys with the most basic mechanical abilities you, you can get deals on those two strokes because guys blow them up. They blow up the piston on the top end. They're very easy to fix. All the tutorials are out there. I see them. I watch bikes all the time on Facebook Marketplace. I'm always in the morning when I have co coffee. I click on there, do my searches. I'm looking for good deals. If I come across something that's way undervalued, uh, then I'll, I'll move on it, buy it. Um, but the, those good, there's good deals out there, especially on those two strokes. Because so, you can easily fix the top end for three or four hundred dollars and you can buy the bike for a little bit of nothing. I see them selling for four or five hundred dollars, needs a top end, no problem. That's a good way to get into a bike. You could have it up and running and going for a grand. We have a super chat from New Life. New Life has a comment, I'd recommend doing a collab with Hammerhand. He genuinely cares about the issues plaguing men. Rolo only sees the dollar signs. Yeah, I, I, I don't know about that with Rolo. I've, I've watched some, some of his stuff. Um, I actually subscribed to his channel and then I watched a little bit of it and then I unsubscribed. It just did, didn't, I don't know, it just didn't appeal to me. Uh, Hammerhand, on the other hand, I do like him. He does, uh, I, I subscribe, I watch almost all of his stuff. He's doing a lot of good work out there. I actually have a conference call uh, with him tomorrow. We're going to talk about the possibility of doing a, um, a collaboration together. So I'll let you know how that goes. Uh, tomorrow's stream. So we, got, we have a call tomorrow at 10. So I'm very much looking forward to talking to him. He's, he's a good dude. Smart guy. New member, Mr. Justin Schweitzer. Shout out to you, Justin. Glad to have you here. Welcome. Welcome. And Nick Wolfer. Nick Wolfer, he's been a member with us here for two months. He has a comment. How do you record a single Proho jingle working full time? Juggle. How do you... Re how do you re Rec, a single proho juggle working full time, house remodel, hobbies, exercises, health, eating, sleep feels like too much for most times. Boy, yeah. How do you juggle it? Um, it just, it's long days. I mean, to be honest with you, um, you know, what I find, you can actually turn a day into two days, literally, if you're efficient with your work. And that's how you can really do it. The, the key is to start early. Start early. Get up early. I, I usually like to get up at like 5 o'clock or so. From 5 o'clock to 6, or let's say 6 to 7, you, know, that you can take care of your breakfast, and you can do your cold shower and get your workout in that. And now at 7 o'clock, when a lot of people are just kind of getting up or just having their coffee, you're already set up, and you're ready to go. You know, and from, you, I can have from 7 o'clock until almost till noon, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, that's 5 hours. Let's say 7 to 1, usually. Right after lunch, I'll take lunch at one or so. That's a full day, really. If you're not taking breaks and you're not trying to, um, you, you know, you're focused on a task, you have something to do right there. So you can make a choice. You can, if you want to work less and have more time, that's what you do. You get up early and you end your day at two o'clock. Start at 6.30, 7 o'clock and just stay focused, no breaks, no lunch, 
and you're done. At one o'clock, two o'clock, you can have the rest of the day free. And that's when most people are just taking a lunch break. And that's really where it's at. If you're really grinding and you want to make stuff happen and, and you want to feed, you want to turn seven days into 14 days, then you've got a second day that starts at two o'clock and that two to six. Two to six o'clock right there is the second day. You know, and if you're un, uninterrupted, it, it, it works. I don't know how, it just, it just works. But getting up early and getting a start, being efficient, and having, you know, being organized makes a big, big difference. One of what I identified, I've identified from my years of experience working in the shop and, and trying to manage multiple things like you're talking about. And the biggest time killer is disorganization, where you are looking for something. You know, it is not uncommon. It was definitely has not been uncommon in times of my life when my shop was a disaster or I was in transition from moving to one place to another where an hour to an hour and a half a day was wasted on just looking for tools, looking for things that I knew that I had, but I couldn't find them. And what's really bad, and this has happened too, you can, you can easily dump three hours like this. You'll spend an hour looking for something, you can't find it, and then you get fed up with it. So then you get in the car, now you're driving to the hardware store, Home Depot, buying it. You know, there's another hour, an hour back. Pretty soon, you know, now it's lunchtime and you haven't even started your project because of disorganization. You've got to be super, super efficient. Also, I'm always thinking ahead of time about what, what it is that I'm trying to accomplish. Identify what it is. What are we doing here today? What are we doing here? What am I trying to accomplish in, in this block of time that I have? Okay, let's identify it. Okay, we are going to do a full service on the lawnmower right? Or the, or the tractor, whatever it may be. That's the project for the day. How do I become efficient with that? Well, first off, okay, we've identified what it is we want to do. Now, do we have a place to do it? Okay. Is the shop clean? Well, because we keep our shop organized and we put things away when we're done, we're not having to clear a spot. We're not moving things around. We're not trying to do work out in under a shade tree in the gravel, losing stuff, bolts, tools, you know, having a negative experience. It all really comes down to that organization. So your shop is clean, you pull your tractor in, okay, this is the job I'm going to do. What do I need to accomplish this? Well, I need tools and I need parts, filters, oils, that sort of thing. What tools do I need? Identify those tools. Am I looking for them? No, they're all organized. Put them out on the bench. There's a clear bench. Go get the fluids because we're organized and we keep our, an inventory of the oils that we want. We have all the AMSOIL stuff in the back because we keep two oil filters, two services. So you see where I'm going with this? By proper planning ahead of time, then you can enjoy your work. The oil change that would have taken me all day in the past because I've got to run to town for this and I've got to run back for this and I've got to look for this now is done in 45 minutes because I've already done the legwork because I'm organized. I have my inventory. I keep my tools and my shop set up properly. That's how, you, that's how you get time. You have to be efficient. Just the amount of equipment that we have to manage as ProHo, just all of the disciplines, let alone the sports and the hobbies and, and such, it's, it's more than a man should be able to do and to try to keep all track of that in your head. And if you've got a, little kids running around and not only are you worried about your own equipment, but you've got to worry about their equipment and keeping their stuff running as well, You've got to be organized and you've got to be efficient. You've got to have systems, everything in place. It's the only way. It's the only way. I, I pulled my hair out for years, just crisis managing all the time, running around, just, just burning the, the, the um, enthusiasm and energy that I had from youth, fully taking advantage of that in, in poor efficiency, just out of sheer running around <laughs> with my hair on fire. Now I do things very differently. I want to enjoy everything my hand finds to do. You know, if I don't enjoy do, doing something, then I'm not going to do it. So if I find something is a burden to me, well, why is it a burden to me? Is it, has this hobby or this job, has it run its course? Was there a time where I used to enjoy it, but now I'm just moving forward, going through the motions because I've always done something or I've invested so much money in it that I can't not do it and I feel guilty not taking the boat out, not taking the bike out that I put so much money in. Where your heart is, that's where you'll spend your time. And, and you'll find that your time spent there is enjoyable. 
So take a hard look at your life and, and look at the things that are around you in your shop. Take a hard look at them. Do I do this because I love it? Do I work on this because it's a joy to me? Or do I do it because dad always did it? Or because I used to do it and I used to enjoy it, but I I'm just hadn't really thought about it, but maybe I don't enjoy this anymore. You know, look, look at it that way. And I, I think it seems to me that the good book tells us whatever your hand fi finds to do, whatever me it means, wh whatever work you're doing, whether it be for fun or for out of necessity, uh, do it with all your might. Honor God, glorify God in everything your hand finds to do. And you'll, I cannot emphasize the importance of this, beloved, that when you have, I don't care if it's a single car garage, a little space, I don't care if you, your shop is an is a 8x10 shed from Home Depot. Having everything done properly, neat, surround yourself with, with good quality tools, the things that you enjoy, the things that give you pleasure, root out, weed out the things that are no longer bringing joy to your life or, or no longer a necessity. Let them go. Let them go on to someone else and just surround yourself with the things that you enjoy. And you'll find that every task your hand finds to do, or nearly, is going to be a pleasure. It's a, it's a pleasure to work in a nice shop with good tools, clean and organized, having everything that you need. Um, it's one of the pleasures of life. It, it, it really is, is to be able to, to work like that. Look at, look at most garages, especially suburban garages, if you see you drive by. You drive, you see them, you drive by and the garage door is up and what do you see inside? A little tiny spot carved out for maybe her car so she can pull in uh, and then everything packed up, you know, five, six feet high, bikes, sleds, inner tubes, umbrellas, beach balls, I mean just trash, trash. And it's difficult because man was not meant to not have a shop. That's been a great injustice with architectural design in the suburbs and in urban areas is, is, is not allowing, man not, not having a place that, of refuge that he can go. That he can go and tinker with his things, that he can go and listen to his YouTube videos and, and escape. It, it's good for the, the, the house. It's good for your wife to have a little bit of separation from you from time to time. She likes to have her own things. You like to have your own things and you come together when it's time to come together. But to be locked into an environment where you have no place to go um, is, is, is not good. And there's, there's never been an allotment for this type of architecture in these homes for a guy to have a, a small workshop. And I think it's essential. I would rather have, uh, I, I, would, I would draw a line in the sand and even if you have an overbearing spouse who wants to park inside, you say, you know what, um, this is mine. You have the whole house. You decorated it the way you wanted to. You picked out the dishes. You picked out the duvet covers. You've, you've picked out the curtains, all these things. I'm saying it. This, this garage is mine. I'm taking it back. Get your stuff out. Um, get some, some acrobats. Get some bins, whatever. Set yourself up. But this place is mine, and I'm taking dominion of it. <laughs> That's what you need to do, gentlemen. Make it the way you like it. Put in a wood stove if you want to. Mr. Northern Harvest, member for two months. Super chat. Thank you. Thank you, brother. I sure appreciate that. And Grizzly Bear, our newest member. Welcome, Grizzly Bear. We have a super chat from Grizzly Bear. He writes, the first bike I learned on was my dad's 1976 Honda Trail 90. That's the bike I had. I got it wrong. It was the Trail 90. That's exactly what the bike I had when I was 10. 1976 Honda Trail 90. It had trail gears. It would climb anything. Yep, that was, that was exactly it. Mine was gold. The one I had to ride. It was a Trail 90. I, for, I forgot that. Those were, the, those were good times, man. Good times. Mrs. W and I, uh, I took her out to breakfast this week, last weekend. And we went over to the, uh, I like to go over to the, the power sports shop uh, in the springtime because all the new models uh, are there. And I, I've done that every year. I'll, I'll go see the new KTMs and go see the new Hondas. And I have a good dealer not too far from here that has two, they carry two brands. They carry KTM and Honda, which are the two best brands, right? So we got to, we got to see all the new KTMs and I was looking at the new XCWs and such. And they, what I didn't realize that they had reintroduced that Trail 90 as a new bike. 
a brand new, they had a bright red one there. It was bigger CC. I don't know, it was like 110 or 150, but everything about it was bigger. And I was really disappointed by that. It, when I sat on it, being so familiar with that old Trail 90, that one of the best bikes Honda ever made. When I sat on that new one, it was big and wide and it just, they lost the spirit of it. Bigger is not always better. And I was sad to see that when they did a retro version of that, they made it so big. We just don't, we don't, we don't want big anymore. Goodness, we have a super chat for $500 from Mr. David Hale. Goodness, shout out to you. We have Must to do some nice. sound drops on that. Must be nice to have My goodness, it's very, I don't know what to say. Thank you, brother. That's very, very kind of you. Mr. Hale writes, I am tithing to you for now. No better way to spend the money for the common good. You spoke of our tendency to reduce our relationships with God in good times. We tend to treat God as our first responder. Man, oh man, did you not say it? That just gave me goosebumps when you said that because there's such truth in this. God help me without first developing a good, strong, consistent relationship. In Him, in times of low need, keep it up, Cody. Love your vids. Man, that is the story of my life, isn't it? What he's talking about, and thank you, David. That's very insightful, very insightful. And that's absolutely true. It's, it's the human condition. The analogy that, I, I mean, I always picture this in my mind when I'm in prayer, is that the good book talks about being on the straight and narrow. The straight and narrow path is the way. Don't deviate to the left and don't deviate to the right. I, I'll share this story again because it's, a, it's an important story. It's from one of the greatest books, probably the second greatest book ever produced uh, by John Bunyan, which is The Pilgrim's Progress. The Pilgrim's Progress is an, is an allegorical book that John Bunyan wrote while he was in prison. Now, this was written by a man that had no formal education, self-taught, but brilliant. He was able to write in prison a book that has astonished the world um, for centuries and still does today. And I think next to, it was the, the number two selling book for a long time next to the Bible. John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress. It's just something that came to mind when I'm talking about that. The fact that John Bunyan, who was a kind of a contemporary of C.S. Lewis, is certainly in, influential. You know, it was so interesting. I read, C. I found C.S. Lewis before I found John Bunyan. And when I was reading C.S. Lewis, when I get into something, big surprise here, I get my teeth into something and I obsess on it. And, and I really drill down and, and get to, I, I leave no stone unturned. And then, and then as quick as that happens, I'll flip on to the next thing and, and I don't often look back. I get what out, out of it what I need or what I find interesting at the time and then I move on. Well, I got, for a time, a couple of years, I got into really looking into and doing a lot of study of C.S. Lewis and all, I've read all of his books and listened to all of his radio programs. And I kept hearing as I was reading through his, his novels and books, um, he would reference this man, this John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress and, and such and how influential he was. And, and that, so then after that, I went back and I, I read, studied in detail everything that, about Bunyan and, and, and his life. And what was so fascinating was in reading Bunyan, I, I saw so many influences of C.S. Lewis. Uh, almost, I wouldn't, say, I wouldn't say that he plagiarized, he did, didn't plagiarize, but just the ideas and thoughts, I could see how they worked their way into C.S. Lewis's re writings and radio programs, and was obviously, obviously very influential. John Bunyan describes that, that narrow path so perfectly. Now, The Pilgrim's Progress, the, 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 the main character of the book is, a, his name is Christian. And Christian uh, is uh, from a town of destruction. This is an allegorical story, like a, like a fairy tale. And he wakes up and he realizes something, and what he realizes is, is he realizes his sin. So what the whole story is about is in telling this, this fantasy story, this fairy tale, this allegory, it is laying out or detailing what the Christian walk is. From the, from the moment you realize your, your condition, uh, of your standing with God, and, and you realize, and the fear comes over you, like, I, 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 I'm, I'm going to be lost if I don't do something about this. I can't save myself. Uh, of the path uh, of getting to know Christ, um, seeking forgiveness, seeking the relief of the burden of sin that we pack around, 
and then a life of trying to maintain and achieve true Christian character as that was portrayed by us by our Savior Christ. That basically is what it's about. So one of the stories in there and the struggle that Christian is, he's on this path and he's warned by all these people that come into his life not to deviate from the path, stay on the path. No matter what it looks like, stay on the path and you'll be safe. God has provided you safe refuge. You only need to stay on it. The reason why we get into trouble is because we get off the path. We go on our own side quests or side missions um, that God never intended us to do. And I always imagine uh, on that so many times when I've fallen off, fallen away from God or, or, or fell back into my old sins and when I finally come to my senses and, and come seeking forgiveness and repentance to God, I've always had this picture of my mind of, of God laying this beautiful path out in front of me that's straight, right, easy, you know, not too steep, not too rocky, totally doable, right? And if I would only stay on the path, I would be just fine. But I don't stay on the path because I see something shiny over here or I see something over here that allures me or catches my eye. And I think, well, I'm doing quite well here on the path and I'm, uh, God has set my shoulders straight and I'm going along and things are just fine and I've got plenty to eat, no problem. Well, surely I could stray off the path here for a moment and chase this little fantasy or this little excitement, whatever it may be, uh, and then find my way back on the path and everything will be fine, right? I get to have my cake and eat it too, so to speak. Well, I get off the path and I immediately am mired in the mud and then I fall down. Now I'm not, not on the path. I'm not even moving anymore. I'm stuck in the mud and here I am in quite a state. And what do I do? Well, I can't get myself out. I cry for help. God, save me. Why have you... Why have you let me, why have you cast me into this pit of despair? Why, why have you forsaken me? Well, he reminds me, I never forsook you. Did I not tell you to stay on the path? It is you by choice that got off the path. And now here you are, up to your waist in mud. Um, you got yourself in this problem. <laughs> but nonetheless, will save me anyway. And he always does. Picks you up, washes you off, maybe even gives you a fresh article of clothing, puts you, sits you right back on the path, points your feet in the right direction, squares your shoulders, gives you a, even gives you a little nudge, maybe even a backwind to help out, a little tailwind so the traveling is not so difficult, and off you go again, uh, and this time off to the mud on the left side. That is the, that is the condition. <laughs> that is, that's exactly what we do uh, and how we operate. And, and we cry out to God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you abandoned me? But he reminds us, I have not abandoned you. You simply went into a direct, you went a direction or you went to a place that I warned you not to go. And that's what Dave, Dave is talking about here. And then in good times, he says, we tend to treat God as the first responder. Yeah, as the first responder. You know, I don't think, and it's not entirely our fault, it's very difficult to see the Almighty, the Alpha and the Omega, as someone that we can relate to, as someone that we could actually have a conversation with that, that can understand our struggles. It's, you, you could see him as, as this lofty figure in the kingdom, far removed from the, the travails and difficulties of this earth, but we're told over and over again, and we're shown over and over again by the example of how God dealt with men and women in the old times, that he does care, that he's, he's intimately involved. You know, people ask all the time and, and consider this, uh, you know, are, is there life in the universe? Is, are there other creatures? Are there space aliens? A lot of people will believe this. I would imagine that if you were to interview uh, the majority of Americans, it wouldn't surprise me if probably more than half of people, whether they be people of the book or not, will agree or, or will think, believe that there is something outside of us, that there are aliens or other creatures, creatures or what have you. As far as the, the Christian's perspective on that is that that's not incompatible with our belief or with the teaching of the good book. If you go to one of the oldest books of the Bible, the book of Job in the Old Testament, the book of Job pulls back the curtain a little bit. We get to see, get some insights to the spiritual realm of what's going on 
uh, outside of, of what we can perceive and what's going on with God and his government. And we see very clearly there um, a, a council meeting with the Almighty as well as the sons of God uh, and Lucifer himself. And it, it gives you the impression that there is a, I don't know if this is an annual thing that's done, or I don't know how time and space actually works with the Almighty. The only thing we, we're no, we know for sure is the good book tells us that um, a thousand years are as a day with God. So a thousand years, a, a millennium, here in our time would be as one day with God. So obviously time is very different for him. So we don't know what this is, but we definitely see that God, it gives us the impression from the book of Job that God has created others. I don't know if they're the same as us, if they're different. I don't know if he's created them with the same abilities that we have, because we have a unique ability that the other creatures, the other created beings do not have as far as we know, and God has given us the ability to create little people in our own image. I wonder sometimes um, if I wonder if some of the hatred uh, that comes from the adversary and the fallen angels, his confederates, I wonder sometimes if I, I try to imagine what is it about us that he hates so much that why does he make us his entire focus on his vengeance with God? And I answered my own question some years ago in study. I realized, well, if you wanted to do, if, you, if I had an enemy and the enemy wanted to hurt me, um, he could hurt me. He could, he could shoot me. He could stab me. He could poison me. He, he could do all manner of things, torture me. And those things would all be very terrible. But there's one thing that he could do that would be a thousandfold worse than anything that he could do to this mortal coil or my physical body. And that would be to attack my, my babies my daughter, my firstborn son, my children, and I'd have to watch it. Now, I don't think that there's a single pro-ho here that has children that they love that would feel any different than that. that you, which one of you with little ones wouldn't endure the most gruesome punishment and torture on your own person, your own body, compared instead of watching something like that happen in front of you to one of your loved ones, one of your little ones, one of your children. So I, I quickly realized the reason why we are the focus of the attack is because we are created in the image of God. We are his sons and daughters, made in his very own image. Does that mean that God has hands and feet and eyes and fingers and ears and all these things? I would say it most likely is. Because what we have, the proof that we have is that when Jesus appeared in his resurrected form, the new man, in the physical form that he would be in the kingdom, he still, res he still took the same form. And that's the reason, I think, that we're the focus uh, of all of, 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 his, of his evil intentions, is because he knows that he does not have access to God. There's nothing that he can do to God physically to harm him, harm him but he does have, have access to us. And that hurts God tremendously to see us suffering under the hands of this from our, either our own decisions or the decision or, or what the adversary is allowed to do. Yeah, it's a rough deal. The more, and, the more mature I get with this and the more I understand, the more my focus is less upon myself and my own problems and shortcomings and my own struggle in this Christian walk. And it's certainly more sympathetic to what the Almighty has to endure. He has to deal with this. He has to be misinterpreted. He has to be lied about. He has to have people like myself that are full of um, error and sin. He's given us the responsibility to teach others about Him and we do it wrongly. <laughs> it's, 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 uh, I feel sorry for God the older I get, the more and more what He has to deal with. But thank you, brother. That is an incredible, incredibly generous offer and, and very insightful. God help me. Without first developing a good, strong, consistent relationship with him in times of low need. Yeah, and that's the thing. You know, if you were to look at that as a friendship, and why would we look at our relationship with God any different than, than a friendship? Why would we honor our best friend 
or we would treat our best friend on this planet better than we would treat our God. Meaning, do you call your friend? Do you make sure that you um, check in regularly and answer their texts right, you know, in a timely manner to show them the respect? Are you there to help them to, to lend a helping hand when they're in need? Are you there to, 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 I mean, to have that friendship, you have to maintain it. Both sides have to put effort in. If only one side is putting effort in, if only one side is, is putting themselves out there and checking in, making the call, setting up appointments, and the other is not reciprocating that, how long can you have a friendship? A one-sided friendship is not a friendship whatsoever. And God has feelings. You know, the, we are made in His image, beloved. Our, how our passions, our, our fears, our terror, our, our love, our excitement, our enthusiasm, all these are, are attributes of, of God Himself. We're made in His image. And He experiences these things as well. What type of a friendship can a man have with his God if you only use him as a, as a first responder? If you don't ever talk to him in the good times, if you never share uh, when you're happy or you're joyful, you're never bringing him into your home and, and sharing them with your family um, to celebrate you know, milestones or happy times, but you're only the only time you ever ask of him or consider him or even bother to speak to him is when you want something from him. I mean, if you had a friend that did that, that only called you when they wanted to borrow money, that only called you when they needed to use your truck or your trailer or your wood splitter, how long would it take for, for you to resent that person? You know, it wouldn't take very long. About three times borrowing your wood splitter and you know, never ever reciprocating. There wouldn't be a friendship is what I'm saying. You can't have a friendship if you're using God as a first responder. I think that was very insightful. Yeah, good way to put it. Thank you, brother. Mr. Con Tramp. We have Super Chap. Con Tramp. Can we take a moment to appreciate the lessons of our forefathers? Indeed. Today marks four years since the death of my great-grandfather, Emil, veteran of the Winter War and a man of great patience. God bless. Yeah. Khan had access to one of those great men like I did. You know, I've spoke about my grandfather. Um, he was the best, the great, he, he, he was the best man I, I ever knew. Again, you never know anyone's heart, but he had no vices. He had unlimited patience. And he was an incredible, incredible um, He's made me who I am. You know, all of the good things, the very few good things that I possess um, are a direct result from Him. And He is the standard. You know, Christ is my standard. Christ is all of our standard. Never put your faith into, one, into a man. A man will always, almost always disappoint you. Never meet your hero, so to speak. But the sec a second place was definitely my grandfather. Uh, he was a godly man. Um, he had trained himself an entire, it, it, it was the result, his beautiful character and the beautiful man that he was, was a result of him mirroring, being a mirror to his Savior. He was a powerful man of faith. He was a devout Christian and he was a strong believer in Jesus Christ. And that was the guiding light of his life. And he reflected that. You know, ultimately, the goodness in a person, whether that be me or you, that goodness goes against nature if you were to just look at things practically. It doesn't make sense to loan a neighbor or a friend money if you're just going to look at it as, as just the law of the jungle. Your time would be best, your, your, your time would be best served uh, getting, acquiring for yourself, being greedy, only looking out for number one making sure that in the law of the jungle that you were winning. And you can only win. You can't win by being altruistic. You win by being selfish, greedy, and competitive. That, that's, the, that's, that's the guy that comes out on top in that environment. When you find yourself doing the type of things that are contrary to that, sharing your time, paying your tithe, donating your time, helping out people that are struggling, stopping and having a conversation with someone that just needs a shoulder to lean on, um, even though it's cutting into the, to your personal time, 
those are not your natural character. Those are the carnal man's, those are op opposed to the carnal man's characters. That is God inside of you. That is Christ inside of you that's doing that. You are reflecting his good character. And that's what, you know, r really what it came down to. When I looked at my granddad, the reason why he was such a beautiful man, the reason why he had that sweet, gorgeous character that, that was so appealing and just, I, I loved so much was that he was uh, a very clear mirror of his Savior. The, the characteristics of God were reflected in that man's life. And he was loved by his family, and, we're, and we honor him today by the legacy that he lived, by just being a simple man. He didn't do anything extraordinary. But I've, his legacy is, is, is very deeply rooted in me. I remember, and I will make sure I share those stories to honor him. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it's very fortunate, Con. And I feel, I, I realize that now. I wished I would have realized it more back in the day, especially when I got older. I was, him and I were inseparable separable when I was 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Everything changed at 16 when I got my license and I got my car. You know, then I didn't have, now I'm moving on and didn't have time for granddad anymore. You know, he wasn't, he was old, kind of old fashioned and, I wanted things new and wanted my own life and and uh, I, I will regret missing out on those years. You know, it was later, it was many years later, actually, before I really kind of, I never, I wouldn't say I lost connection with him, but I just, I wasn't over there sitting with him in the evenings. I wasn't talking to him on the phone regularly like I had before. And then after I got married and had my own kids, I started to understand and I made reconnected and was able to spend a lot more time with him. And I'm grateful for that. But if you have, if you're fortunate enough, if, you, if you're a man fortunate enough to have a, a grandfather like that in your life, um, make that a priority uh, to spend as much time around that as possible and make sure you appreciate what an incredible blessing that is. There are a lot of men and, and young men and old men in this group here with us right now um, that don't have that and never had that and would very, very much like to. Thank you, brother. Thank you, Con. And Mr. Northern Harvest, two-month member, why two-stroke versus four-stroke? Well, there are many different reasons. The, the battle rages on, right? I can tell you why I like two-stroke. My son likes four-stroke. I like two-stroke. I like two-stroke for a couple different reasons. It's simple, easy to work on. I can rebuild the piston, uh, the whole top end. There's very few moving parts. I know how everything works, very simple. Uh, I like that part of it. Lightweight, lighter weight, lower center of gravity. A, if you take two motorcycles, if you take a two-stroke and a four-stroke, let's say, say you take a 250 or a, a 450, four-stroke, 250, 300, two-stroke, both of them are going to weigh roughly the same, you know, within 10 pounds or so. Not a significant amount. You're talking 220, 230 pounds for a motorcycle. But when you get on them, there's going to be a huge difference. That four-stroke is going to feel very heavy. And the reason why it feels so heavy, even though it's not really any heavier, is because of the design of the engine. Now, the cylinder head sticks up. The thing with motorcycles, it's all about the center of gravity. How can you get your center of gravity down? One mistake that happened to me and to a lot of new riders is you sit on the seat when you're going fast. You, when you get scared, you tend to sit on the seat and you, and you know, when it gets gnarly. That's the worst thing that you can do. It seems intuitive. You think, well, I don't want to be standing up because my center of gravity is so high. I'm going to tip over. I'm going to crash. No, that's not true. When you're sitting on the seat, that's when your center of gravity is the highest. Now you have all of that weight that was on the pegs. So I weigh 200 pounds and with gear, let's say 230 with all my gear on. That 230 pounds is pressing, is where? It's on the pegs, which are where? On the very bottom of the bike. So I have no weight on my handlebars. When you're riding, you know, you don't have weight on your handlebars, you're light on the handlebars. So that center of gravity is very low. Therefore you can corner and move and control the bike much better. It seems counterintuitive, but that's the way that it works. Well, the four-stroke suffers from that because the, the way that the engine design is. The engine design, now you have a cylinder head, just like on the two-stroke, but it's much more complex and it's heavier and bigger. 
and you have cams up there, and you have gears up there, and you've got valves. So you've got a whole bunch of rotating mass. And rotating mass is, is, is really problematic when you want to move it around. If you've ever taken like a bike wheel or held a gyro, you know, once it gets spinning, how you, it corrects itself, you can't hardly turn it. Well, with a four-stroke engine, you're fighting against that gyroscopic effect because of all of that spinning mass way up high on the top of that engine that you don't have with a two-stroke. So when you go to, to muscle the bike or to, or to lean the bike all day long, pushing it, rolling it, maneuvering it, you're having to overcome that centrifugal or that spinning mass and that extra weight. And it's significant. You can immediately feel it. It's very different. Um, the other downside is of the force of the, or, or, so that's kind of the positive two stroke. The two stroke also is very, it doesn't have uh, as much compression and, and or engine braking. So it's very, it's very smooth. It, it's a flowy bike. Um, it, it, it rolls and sm it's just very smooth and, and light and nimble. It, it feels like, an, it, I feel like yesterday when it, I, everything was just clicking. I'm up on the bike, um, light in the hands. You know, you get a strong core because you pinch the bike. It's just like you ride a horse. You pinch it with your legs and you move it around. I can literally move the, the back end of the bike now where I want it because I'm so well connected to the bike. I've learned to ride it smoothly and fluidly. I felt like yesterday when everything was clicking and just flowing, you're just in, you're just in that zone that if, if I could have like a, a mechanical natural extension from my own body, if I could be like a modern day Husqvarna scimitar, or is it the scimitar, uh, the half horse, half man, this is the perfect machine. This, this is what would grow out of me, and this would be the perfect, the, the perfect mach, maturation, mesh between man and machine in this environment. It, it, you know, where, when I get on Jack's bike, because of that flowy nature of it, when I get on Jack's bike, the engine braking, you know, it's back and forth. So uh, there's a lot of nuances and, and guys that like, there's guys that prefer four stroke over two stroke. Um, you don't have to mix, you know, I, I don't need to get into all the details, but that's, that's why I like it. That's th some of the reasons why I like it. Mr. Tony Seed. Shout out to you, Tony. Welcome. Be nice. Good to have you here. You inspired me to buy my first saw, a used steel 291. That's a great saw. With an upgraded 25 inch bar, chain is sharp and it runs good so far. I bought some used saws. I've never had a problem with buying used saws. People are really leery about that uh, and buying used power saws, but you can tell. What you, if you're looking at buying a used power saw, the main thing you're looking at, what I do is I, I look and see, is it abused? You know, it is the, it, look, flip it up on the bottom and look and see, you can see how much wear is on it. How much, is, how much paint is off the bottom, you know, just from picking it up and sitting it down, how many dings are in the aluminum. If you have a really clean bottom on a saw, you pr pretty much guaranteed that it hasn't had that much use. And even so, like I said, with the two strokes, that's the wonderful thing about those saws is that even Proho can go buy a top end kit and redo a piston on your steel saw very easily. It's um, easy to work on. I wouldn't be opposed to buying a used saw whatsoever. Just, just be careful. Yep, it's, that's one of the most satisfying things in life, man, is just burying that 25 inch bar into a fresh, with a fresh chain on, uh, it's, uh, it's good. It gives me the fizz. Mr. Justin Schweitzer, and new member, shout out to you, welcome. He writes, I just wanted to say thank you for making me a better man. You are doing more than you know, sending prayers and love to you and to the family. Yeah, I appreciate that. And I, again, we need to be very careful. We're all in this together. I, I don't, uh, this is not false modesty. Let's not get down that road or anything. I, I suffer from the same shortcomings as you guys do. We're all, we all share the, the common struggle. When you see goodness in a man, always remember that, that the only goodness that you see in a man is because of, of the goodness of God that's reflected in him. And the, and the closer that a man is to God truly, not by mouth, but by action and deed, um, you'll know they're different. When you're around someone that's close to God, that is a, has true Christian character, you'll just know. You won't, they won't need to preach to you. They won't need to tell you. They won't need to Bible thump. You'll just know. They just have a sweetness, a kindness, a spirit about them 
uh, that is just different. It's just contrary to the world. It stands in, in stark contrast um, to what you're used to experiencing on a day-to-day -day basis. And that's what we're trying to achieve, man. We're trying to achieve to be more like him. Really, that's our ambition. We have a super chat from Mr. Willie Jenkins. Shout out to you. Thank you, Willie. Appreciate that. And Anarchy Tattoo Studios, good to see you back. Goodness, that's Met very generous nice. of you. Thank you, brother. Met me nice, from the Bronx, NYC. You know, he's a hard man. I have to give it up to the Bronx. Our, our, if you're going to be an East Coast man, you might as well be from the Bronx. I wouldn't give, I'm not going to give the Bronx official West Coast status as of, as of yet, but it certainly, I would consider it. Uh, Mr. East Coast man is going to have to prove to me, or Bronx man is going to have to prove to me, give me some good reasons as to why he should have West Coast status, and I will consider it. Anarchy says, I've been blessed with great talent, and I love what I do. I know I will have to leave it behind with what's to come, especially in cities. My question, what are your thoughts of my profession in relation to God? As a tattooist, man, that's an interesting question. Do you, are, hmm. I have to be careful with my black and white here. I don't have any tattoos. I don't have any tattoos because I don't like them. Now, is this a, is this a, this is not a salvation issue. This is a, this is nothing more than a personal preference. And I'm not going to judge anyone that wants to get a tattoo or that that's important to them. I, I, most of the people that I know, I would say, well, not most, I would say over half of the people that I know have tattoos. Um, probably more women than, than men. Uh, it, it's quite popular out here. And for varying reasons and, and different things. I had a friend, the first friend of mine that when I was younger that got a tattoo, uh, the first two friends, uh, I remember when they were talking about it. It was, it was a lot bigger deal when I was 18. Now it's very common. And you never saw them on women unless they were like uh, whores or something like that. But you never saw it on, on virtuous women. Uh, but, but some dudes. Um, and the guys decided kind of collectively, hey, we're going to go down to the tattoo shop. And I, and I, you know, I don't know why I didn't fall in with that at the time. I don't know that I had the strong opinion about it now that I did then. Um, but I just didn't feel like I wanted to do that. It just felt like it was so permanent. And they went down and they really had no ideas of what type of tattoo that they wanted. All they wanted was a tattoo. And when they told the story later, uh, how they determined what they got for tattoos was that there was a book there um, and the tattoo artist um, gave them these books and they flipped through it and they found something they thought looked cool and they inked that on his arm. My first friend had a, a rose, like an axle. This, this would have been like in the Motley Crue days. He had a, a rose with a, with a dagger through it and it wasn't very big and it wasn't very good. And he came back and... He was showing that to me. He's like, yeah, isn't that cool? Like, I guess. I said, uh, is there significance to that? No, no, I just thought it looked cool. Okay. Well, then my, the other friend pulls up his pant, and he would got uh, a giant Yosemite Sam, like this big on his calf, a Yosemite Sam, a cartoon character. And I knew him, to, you know, my whole life. I knew him from the time that he was uh, a baby. We grew up together. And I said, uh, I didn't know you were a Looney Tune fan. And he's like, oh, I'm not. He goes, he goes I don't know. He's like, I, you know, I thought I, I, it was in the book. I thought it was cool. You know, and that was the story for the, for the guys that, that got the tattoos. <laughs> you know? so, so I thought, well, man, that's really something, man. I mean, that's really put, putting it out there to, to make a decision that's, that's going to be so permanent based on so little and so something is so insignificant as I just felt like it at the time and did it. I never have uh, thought that that was a very good idea. And, you know, later on, of course, there was much regret. <laughs> uh, we have a friend, <laughs> we have a friend, a, a woman, uh, this would have been like in the, in the nineties that decided to get a tramp stamp uh, because that was popular when I was younger. And guess what she got the tramp stamp of? Uh, an indigo girl's quote. Now she's 
in her 50s, uh, you know, a mother uh, with children, and she has an Indigo's girl, Indigo Girl's quote of a tramp stamp on her 50-year-old body. Uh, do you think there's any regret there for that? So I'm just laying some, frame, some, some groundwork. If that's your motivation, just to be edgy or to go to a tattoo parlor and buy a turnkey persona, uh, and that there's no significance to it, uh, man, I, just, I, I never have understood that. And I think that that is a terrible mistake and, and kind of a foolish thing to do. Now, if you were going to do something of significance. Now, again, this is not something that I really, I would ever do. I don't have any tattoos. Mrs. W doesn't have any tattoos. It's actually, you know, I found it kind of, kind of funny that not having tattoos in this current time is actually, that's what's punk rock now. That's actually the new counterculture to be p free of tattoos <laughs> because I'm in the, I'm in the minority here. Now, what about someone who goes in with intention, with purpose? What, what about our, our, is it our Maori friends, you know, that have the, the, the tribal tattoos and, and the, it's part of their heritage and their tradition? What about a man that um, gets a, 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 the tattoo of his military regimen or, or unit um, to, to, to be a part of a, an elite group or a fraternity of guys like that? Or what about um, a guy that's involved in a biker gang um, where tattoos have significant, significantly mark um, important events in a person's life? You know, no issues with that whatsoever. Not that, not that whether or not I have issues matters. It, you know, you do what you want to do. So I guess that's how I would look at it. I, would pr I, I, I find tattoos on women to be disgusting and, and to be low class. I would not want to be with a woman with a tattoo. It, when I was back, when I was dating, that was a that was a no go for me. If that was that was if that was a girl with a tattoo, um, I don't care. There was nothing else to say beyond that. It was it, that was for someone else. That was not for me. I didn't want it. I didn't want the the physical, the beautiful body and, and everything that God has created. I don't want that marred by something like that. It just seems somewhat unbecoming. On women that's my personal opinion it's, it's it, it carries no more weight than that so I guess where I would fall on that some Christians will say will, will make the argument that it that it that that the Bible clearly references that this is something that people should not do I've seen the evidence I don't know I think that's maybe a bit of a stretch it depends on what the intention is um, but I, I'm not gonna go out there and say that um, and I'm not gonna sit up here and judge anyone there's a lot of good God-fearing folks that are covered with tattoos. There are a lot of some of the best people I've ever met, the most generous, um, self-sacrificing, most capable people are covered with tattoos, sleeves and all of that. So I make no judgments whatsoever, except for on women. It, I, I, th I think it's low quality. It just seems classless on women. I, I, that, when I see that, it physically repulses me. I don't like it. But on men, it doesn't bother me at all. Uh, if my friends had sleeves, neck tattoos, all that, face tattoos are, are a little hard for me. I find that somewhat distracting. I wouldn't, ne wouldn't probably condone that. But, um, you know, if that's what you want to do and, and there's a significant purpose or reason behind it, um, man, I wouldn't fault a guy for doing that. But if it's just, I want to be, I want to be hard or I want to turnkey persona, so I'm going to go there and, and pick something out with no meaning, I, I question the wisdom of that. But um, no, I wouldn't. I, I don't know, man. I, I, I have to assume that Anarchy Tattoo Studios is, is a tattooist and he's probably good at what he does. And you're, it's going to be difficult to have that, take that vocation to a rural location or, or a remote area. But if you're a creative individual, you know, if, you, if you have that type of ability, I would, it takes a special person to be a tattooist. Certainly, man. I don't know that I'd want to do it or could do it. Um, I'm sure that would translate. You know, God will use you as long as you go forward. That's, that's the thing. If you can't see the path clearly, if you're in a situation where you're watching these videos and you, you're watching the news, you're aware of what's going on around you in your environment, you're starting to see how the cities are deteriorating and they're getting to be more and more dangerous and you feel the call to get out of this environment, but you don't know what you're going to do because 
everything you've ever done and known is in the city. I, I understand. And I, I, had, I went through that myself. But move forward. God has a plan for you. The reason why many of you are here is God's called you here. He's waking you up. He's bringing knowledge to your minds. He's bringing awareness of what's going on. He's calling you out of the world. He has a work for you. So I don't know what that is. But that's one of the most difficult things is, is that faith. is to step forward, knowing, hearing the call of God to get out of the city and not exactly knowing where you're at. I don't want, you don't want to be foolish and just, okay, I hear, I want to do this, just go do it with no plan. A man needs to have a plan. But also, you can get paralyzed, analysis paralysis, by just sitting around thinking and planning and thinking and trying, you know, and never anything really comes up or you don't have a clear path as to what, what God wants you to do. Therefore, you never move. And, you know, God will not endure, will not endure forever with you. He'll, he'll come to you. The Holy Spirit will put that desire upon you to do whatever it is, His will is, whatever your new role is in life. But you've got to move forward sometimes in faith, knowing that, well, I have a skill set. I don't know exactly how it's going to be applied in this location. But um, sometimes you just need to go there and do it. And, you know, we make mountains or molehills mole into mountains. The more we stew, the more we think about projects, the bigger they become and the bigger the obstacle becomes and the bigger the hurdle. How many times, is this not a, a reality of life, gentlemen? You've been putting off a project, something that you really don't want to do. It's going to be a bad one. You know, maybe you've got to replace the U-joints in all your drive shafts or you've got to do, pull the front end apart on your truck, replace the ball joints, and you've never done that before. And you watch the videos and you think you can do it. And you put it off and put it off. And then the longer you put it off, you just, it gets, becomes bigger and bigger. More of a problem, more of an obstacle, and just a great burden to your life. How many of you have experienced this? Finally, you decide, okay, I'm resolved. I've set the day aside. We're going to tackle this. How many have experienced this where you jump in there, you do it. It takes about a fourth or a third the time you were expecting it to take. And you wonder, why didn't I do this a long time ago? It was never that big of a deal. Men are very clever and resourceful. God has given us very amazing minds and the ability to, be, to adapt to all sorts of situations. you got to trust your own ability sometimes. My dad said something that I remember. You know, he, when, I was, when we were going through, you know, prefer, you know, actually moving out of the cut city and trying to prepare and, and trying to be self-reliant, self-sufficient. And I used to go over there and visit him and like, Dad, you need to get, you need to get this and, and you, you need to get that and uh, you need a proper rifle. And he's like, oh, yeah, yeah, maybe, maybe someday. You know, he never really worried about that too much. And when I pressed him on it one time, he said, you know, he goes, I don't worry about it too much. He goes, I've always been very adaptive and um, I can figure things out. And whenever I find myself in that situation, I know, I trust myself, I trust my intellect, I trust my abilities and my experience. I'll figure out a path, I'll figure out a way. And I would rather just deal with the problem when it comes than trying to account for it every day in life. Always thinking, always worrying, you know, never prepared, you know, never have enough stuff. And that's, I think the balance is somewhere in the middle. Be prepared the best you can. Don't put your family at risk or yourself in the poor house buying things or getting into financial situations that are going to come back and bite you. Do what you can that's reasonable and trust in your intellect and your ability as a pro-ho to figure out the solution when you get there. Mr. Colin Gomez, shout out to you. Thank you, Colin. Colin says, I always watch a day late, but I just swung in to tell you I bought my first Enduro 2005 KLR 250. Man, that is a good good choice that's where it's at brothers i'll tell you man the kawasaki's i think i've been looking around myself you know i've been talking all this stuff about getting cheap motorcycles uh, i better look and see if they're out there the klr the kawasaki 250 seems to be that's that's the bike i mean that really is it's the best value there's a lot of them out there the hondas of course the old xrs the crfs the 250s 230s wonderful bikes old bikes easy to work on Aftermarket parts, super cheap. Uh, it doesn't have to be polished. Actually, the, the more beat up it is, the better it is. Just make sure it's mechanically sound. I am 
beyond meticulous with my bike. Beyond meticulous. I tell you, I go over, I, I mean, I, it, it's my thing. I like it. I'm not concerned about aesthetics. I'm not concerned about scratches or little dents or dings here and there. That's all part of the game. This is a tool. It's an instrument to be used. What I do care about are the important things. The drive chain, the clutches, you know, the engine oil, filters, tires, wheels, grips, everything, you know, the things that matter that affect my connection to the machine, uh, the performance of the machine. It, it is all these things, these little things matter because they all stack up to the final result. And what makes a machine a great machine, whether it be a racing machine, a race bike, race car, um, my 300 that is seven years of evolution to where it's at right now to be a near perfect mechanical machine for me in the environment that I like to ride in is it, what makes it so good and so extraordinary is a whole bunch of little things that, that work properly, that work together for a common good. And you, you, for example, I can have everything just perfect. I went out, not yesterday, but the day before yesterday, and I was having trouble with the front end. The front end is washing on me, and, and it, it, it rattled my confidence, and therefore it, it, it messed up my whole day. I felt it was, it was untrustworthy, and I had a new tire on, and you know, a couple things were different, and I was just not comfortable with it. It scared me right off the bat, and therefore all day I was just on, I was just on edge, not enjoying it. Well, it was one thing. I, rare, this, I, I almost never do this, but I got lazy, I didn't check the tire pressure. Didn't check the front tire pressure, and it was down seven, eight pounds from what I normally ride at, and it made all the difference in the world. And when I rode yesterday, brought the tire pressure up to what I know and like on the tire that I know and like, that I know what to expect from it. I know how far, how much pressure I can put on it. I know how much grip it has in a corner at 60. And then it changes everything. So those details, that's why it's important the thing with the motorcycles, why it's so important to stay up on top of them and understand how they work, and especially the mechanical stuff, is because what motorcycles are is they are high performance on a budget. You get the incredible performance that you would get from a, a trophy truck, let's say, or, or an equivalent race car, but at a fraction of the cost. It's, it's, a, it's attainable for a common man. It's affordable. You could still... I got a common man, to prove the point, a common man can build a bike and go race the Baja 1000 and do well. But you can't afford it. You can't do that on a, on a race car or truck, usually without sponsors and stuff. So it's cheaper. It's cheap performance, but it comes at a cost is you pay for, the cost that you pay is with, you don't have any protection, is your body. If you crash on a motorcycle, it's very different than catch, crashing with something with a five point and a roll cage. So you understand this, you take on this risk that your body is a sacrificial element in this versus a bumper, a roll cage, a five point. That's why for me, it's important to know. I wanna make sure everything's right. I want the axles to be torqued. I want the tire pressure to be right. I wanna know everything. I want something falling off or anything failing because I'm gonna pay the penalty for this with my, 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 my flesh and bone, my flesh and bone. Shout out to you, brother, Colin. That's a good bike. That was an excellent choice. I approve. We have a member message from Logan Carnes. Logan's been with us for five months. Shout out to you. Logan writes, what military style radio would you recommend? I don't know enough about him to recommend one. Proho is recommending the Bofang because that's attainable for us. Um, I, I, I don't know. I, I would like to have a Harris. I'd like to have a Motorola. I'd like to have one of those super fancy digital radios, but it's, it's, it's just not my interest. I could go get one of those, of course. But uh, what's attainable for me? What can I actually use? What will I use? What do I use? The little Bofang radio, $70, one and done. Um, I guess it doesn't really matter. I mean, you stick with any of the n name brands. The main thing you need to do have with a radio, I think, is just know how to use it. As long as it's programmable, you know, anyone could show up. Let, let's say a bunch of dudes showed up and we're going to go do a, I'm going to take out everybody out on an awesome motor ride. They show up with three different radios. That's fine. It doesn't, they don't all have to be the same. As long as everybody can program the frequency, I can give them the free, frequency. You know how to do that, and then we're all good. 
So it, it doesn't really matter. But I, I'm not the expert on it. I, I have not used them. I don't know much about them. Uh, for me and mine, and we, what we use daily, up in the snow, in the worst environment, in the hottest desert, daily, almost daily, we use those little Bofang radios. And they're, they're, they've, they've never failed us. They've never let us down. So I got no problem with those. That's what I recommend. We have Paleo52 in the chat and new member. Welcome, Paleo. He says, did you read the book about outdoor skills? Or do you read books about outdoor skills? If you do, what books do you like? Read Bushcraft, my Morris. Uh, I got a, a few, a, a few, not too many. I, most of those things um, that are in those books, I, um, I already know. And they're, the, the modern books, many of them are really kind of dumbed down. And, and the last few books that I've seen, I've, I've, it's hard to get excited about them because they're just showing things that I've already either known how to do or I've watched on YouTube videos. I'll tell you my favorite, oh, is it possible? My favorite book, it's out, sadly out of print, but it's, yeah, I see it. I'm going to show you that this is a good one. If you could ever find one of these on eBay or I think this was my I think this was my granddad's on eBay or used bookstore. This is Camping and Wood Camping and Woodcraft Volume 1. I'd like to see Volume 2. Can you see that? Can you focus? By the author is Kephart, K E P H A R T. And this book is extraordinary, man. This this is was published probably uh, I'm guessing probably 1900, 19. Does it say here? Let's see if I can find it. Camping and Woodcraft: A Handbook for Vacation Campers and for Travelers in the Wilderness. What he goes into is it's incredible with illustration. You know, this is all the knowledge here. Is that focusing? I'm, I'm not going to read all of it. Come on now. Focus. Focus! You hateful thing. There's a picture of an axe and a knife there. What he goes into with this, this is, in this book is all of the knowledge that the frontiersmen had. Trappers, explorers, this guy was still alive and still had that information. Also, everything that had been learned from the Native Americans about how to survive in the West. How to provision for a group of men. What is going to be needed on an exp expedition and why. Like, this is not like modern think so. This is like real world back to the basics. How to deal with bears. How to deal with grizzlies. How to deal with how, to, how a a woodsman walks in the forest. You know there's a special way to walk when you're in the woods? You'll see it, loggers develop it. My granddad taught me, he taught me in hunting. And this guy is the only guy, my, now my granddad explained this to me when I was a boy, how to walk in the forest, how to walk silently, and how to walk without injuring yourself or tripping and falling down. You, know, you think, oh, what, you know, why is that important? Well, it was re all of these things were very important when you were working and living in an austere environment. If you were to be 18 months, two years, three years on a trapping expedition out west, and you, just you and your old number seven mule, everything matters. The slightest cut, falling down, sp spraining an ankle, busting a knee, everything mattered. It was everything was life or death and everything was very deliberate. There's, there was no haphazard anything in there. So it was all documented. And this was all knowledge that was known and, and fathers taught sons and grandfathers, grandchildren. And I, I got to receive a lot of that because my granddad grew up with that and, and knew that. And when I was skimming through this book and I found the portion where, I, I believe it was this book, where he was talking about how, how a woodsman walks in the forest, uh, I knew that I had something like this is this is true knowledge right here. This is the knowledge that my grandfather had and it's in book form and this is forgotten. Everything in here, almost everything in here is no longer known and will be without this book. How, how would you know it? 
But the, the walking in the forest is interesting. Uh, if you watch loggers, because of the ground is so uneven, you're either, you're either climbing up mountains or going down. There's a, a lot of uh, cover on the floor, so you can't see. There's a lot of sticks. And so you, you just develop this very loose hip gait uh, where you're moving, where you're never rigid. You're never clomp, clomp, clomping. So you're, you're, just, you're moving almost like a cat. And my granddad taught me how to walk that way. You almost kind of snake through the forest. And guys, it's not unlike guys that you've seen that have been at sea a long time. How they, be, they can become very easy on the on a deck that is pitching back and forth. You know, they can easily, they just, they kind of roll with it and move with it almost cat-like. Well, a forest walk is very similar. When you're there all day long and you're dealing with this and all these trip hazards and uneven ground, there are no trails or no paths. You just, you just develop this slinky cat-like walk that, is, um, that protects you and just m makes it easy and takes less energy in, in the forest. So I don't know. You know I, I haven't looked at all the modern books, and there's probably some good bushcraft stuff out there, but when I do get those, I've had several people send different books to me. I flip through them and I think, well, man, compared to the old stuff, you know, like the real meat and potatoes of forestry, bushcrafting stuff, it, um, it always seems a little lackluster to me. Plus, I would rather watch, I'd rather watch a guy do it on YouTube. Thank you, brother. Good point. I have a, I'm trying to get a message from Mrs. W here. One second here. I don't know how I, that came through here. Okay, we're gonna have to wrap up. Let me wrap up these last super chats. I gotta go, gentlemen. I got, uh, I've got a lunch date with Mrs. W. Um, we're actually taking her car, her car, her car. So I put, Mrs. W's got a 2018 Toyota 4Runner TRD that we bought a few years ago. Well, she, she's hit two deer, uh, and the first deer that she hit was about $5,000 of damage in the front. So instead of replacing the factory grill and plastic and headlights and all of that from the deer strike, I put on a big heavy-duty Australian ARB bumper on the front. Well, that's super nice. The second deer she hit just bounced off of the side into the ditch and no, no damage to the rig because these are designed for that. Well, the problem is, is the extra weight of that front bumper uh, just kind of pushed the nose down. I knew it was riding a little bit low in the front and it never has kind of felt right. She's always kind of complained that it felt heavy in the front that she has not liked that bumper on there. And I didn't think too much about it. I thought, oh, you know, she's she doesn't know what she's talking about. That bumper is good. Well, I drove it not too long ago, and I realized, oh, she's <laughs> she's right. She's been complaining about this for years. It does not feel very good. It needs to have a little bit. We need to compensate. We need we need need to to put heavier springs in the front, better suspension on the front to compensate for that. And those you know those forerunners, they sit like you know they sit like a bird dog anyway, with the tail up in the air and the nose down. I don't know if that's for bumper height or what. So it already sits wrong. So we're dropping it off. I ordered in um, coilover, Bilstein, or Bil new Bil Bilstein adjustable front suspension that's going to uh, compensate heavier springs uh, designed to offset the weight of that front ARB bumper and um, a little bit more travel. So we're going to level that front up or we'll probably raise the front end on that two inches and just leave the stock height in the back. So that's going to change all that. So we have to, we've got to drop that off. We have an appointment and then I've got to go pick her up. So I cannot be late, gentlemen. Mr. Ryan Warren. Goodness. Shout out to you, Happy Ryan. Night. Happy night. Very generous super chat. Thank you, brother. He writes, I don't know if you remember my chat from months ago, but I'm getting cut off by half of my family because of a trans cousin. Yeah. I had that kind of relationship with my grandpa. I got kicked out of his rental house because I got kicked out of his rental house because of beliefs. Yeah. You know, there's, I, I, I get it, Ryan. No, you're not the only one. You're not the only one. You know, the, the good book warns us about this. This is a sign of the times of the final days. The good book tells us that in the final days, there's going to be a great division among people. 
and not just nations, which has always been the case, but against people that have traditionally gotten along very well, mainly families. Families, there's going to be big bones of contention in families because there are going to be some of those that remain faithful to the law of nature and the law of God, and there are some of those that are going to be faithful to the law of progress, progressive, um, and of man. So you're either siding with God or you're siding against God. It really comes down to that. Was it not George W. Bush? Either you're with us or you're, with us or you're against us? And that's what's going to happen. So you haven't done anything wrong. You, you're under attack. Your family has probably leveled all sorts of accusations, and you're the bad guy, and, and you're the intolerant one because you're, you're not willing to compromise what you know to be true, right, and just, and according to the law of God. So you haven't done anything wrong. You've actually done everything right. It's not you that is on the wrong side of the argument, it is they that is on the wrong side of the argument. And you could do no, no, nothing less than what you did by sticking to what you know to be true and not compromising. And all of us, if you haven't already, all of us sitting here that are on the side of, of the Almighty, that are, in, that are standing in line, in the recruitment line for God's army, the Christian soldiers, are going to have to make these hard decisions. It may not be that particular one, but it'll be something similar, maybe even more difficult. It will be a test of faith, a test of obedience to see, are you serious? Before I bring you into my work, before I bring you into my army, God will sometimes test us, oftentimes will test us, to see what our resolve is. Because what he knows is that we're going to have to endure incredible pressure. We're going to have to endure incredible persecution for our faith and for our belief. And if we're not able to stand up for what is right in the little things, if we're easy, if we quickly compromise in the little things, then we're of no value when God needs to lean upon us for hard things. So it's a training ground. Who will side on what is right and who will not? This is the division that is taking place between the sheep and the goats. So don't, look, don't, don't be surprised or don't feel that, like you've been singled out or picked upon because your family has denied you or is not, a, not giving you access. This is the natural way of things. And this, is, this, this was clearly laid out. Okay, thank you, Overton. I'm getting, Mrs. W is communicating through, my, through the back channel here. Mr. Jamie, welcome. Good to see you. Jamie has been one of our, our most faithful subscribers. It's always good to see you in the chat. Jamie writes, is it worth getting another trailer for utility purposes, various tasks, hauling mowers, etc., so you can save some wear and tear on the dump trailer? Yeah, I would say that absolutely it is. First off, those little landscaping utility trailers are a whole lot easier to, to maneuver. Uh, around town, um, a whole lot less wear and tear. Those big dump trailers are pretty, pretty big units. Uh, just the, what you'd probably save on wear and tear in a year on tires, wheels, fuel consumption, you know, wear items on a big truck in that trailer, you could buy a good used small utility trailer. You know, a couple thousand bucks, fifteen hundred bucks for a utility trailer. I would absolutely do that. You'll never lose money with a trailer. If you buy a used trailer, you buy right, good quality one that's in good shape, take care of it, it's money in the bank. You probably, in 10 years, make more from it than what you paid for it, provided you take care of it. You know, that's the key. You know, keep the deck boards nice and keep it painted. And when you pull out of the gas station and forget to put your hitch jack up and you tear the bottom off of it, replace things when they break, you know what I'm saying, like that. But yeah, saw a guy on TikTok uh, this morning that had done exactly what I've been telling you guys. If you're looking for a side hustle, what he did is he bought himself a dump trailer and he had a, a it was a crummy one, like an old beat up one, painted it up real nice, put his name on the side and got, put his name out there and started hauling, uh, doing cleanup of people's houses, went to the rich, rich folks in the suburb. And word gets out really quickly, he hauls off junk. You call him, he shows up, either he will unload the, whatever it is, 
your junk that you don't want, or it could be uh, the death of a loved one that the family just doesn't want to deal with it. He goes there, he solves the problem, he'll leave a dump trailer there, he'll do it himself, and he's reselling this stuff. Uh, and he was telling me that he's looking at a seven-figure income that's within reach because he's grown and expanded his business. Now he has employees and he's got other, you know, he's got dumpsters now and stuff. He's gonna turn that into a million dollar business, a junk hauler. Just a single dude with a high school education. So don't tell me that you can't do it. How cool is that? I think that's so cool. How much cooler is that? You'd be rolling around in your old 1987 Ford with your dump trailer uh, and you've got a couple of employees and you're, you know, you're making six feet. You're, you're making more money than a guy that's leasing a brand new BMW that's looking down his nose at you when you stop for lunch at, at McDonald's, right? I always, I, I think that's cool, man. Yes, utility trailers, you can never go wrong, as long as you've got the place to put it. We have a super chat from Happy Little Accidents. Happy Little Accidents, welcome. He says, I have 10K in the bank, 10K in cash, not in the bank. I have 3K in silver. Okay, I think we have a, a rate my pro ho opportunity here. He's got 10K in the bank. He's got 10K in cash. That's 20, 20 grand on hand, liquid. That's really good. Uh, three grand in silver. He's got food storage for a year. That's a year's worth of food storage, man. That is a lot of food storage. That's, that's good for you, man. Rifle, sidearm, but I live in the Burbs in South Carolina. What do you recommend? for my family of seven to be logically secure. Well, man, you're doing it. I mean, I, I don't need to recommend anything. I, well, I don't know that I can recommend anything because I don't have enough information here. But here's how you can simply find out how prepared you truly are. Get your family together. And if you can do this for a week, you will know exactly. <laughs> Shut the power breaker off. Shut the power breaker off with a family of seven and to see and eat off of your stocks. Eat the food that you've saved. Eat it for seven days uh, and you'll quickly see. You know, the, the, I, I love the concept of the um, Hudson Bay start. We've often talked about that here. The Hudson Bay start is really the only way to, to, to really prove out your systems. The Hudson Bay Company was up uh, in the Northern Territories, and it was the jump-off point for guys that were exploring the Yukon. They were going up there to find their fortune, either gold or uh, trapping. Now, you got to remember, you know, there's so much opportunity here for us today with the Internet. I mean, just look at me. I, I, I can sit in front of a, in my shop and turn on a camera, and I can support my family and make a living by making videos online. There's... This was not an option. This has not been an option for, for men except for the last few years. If a man, like if you look at the circumstances and you look at the lack of mobility that you had and the lack of resources, let's say that you're 1850s man, born on a poor farm in Oklahoma. With What, what are your prospects? You don't have any family contacts. You don't have any political capital. Uh, you don't have uh, an education or even have access to one. You don't even know what you don't know. What is your chance of, of changing your station in life for the 1850s man? It's, z it's almost zero. I mean, maybe a few guys would get out, uh, extraordinary guys, and m maybe start a business. But could you start a business as easy then as you can now? I mean, I don't think we understand the difficulties. You were basically... What you were born into, that was your environment. So just imagine as a young man that has, you have higher ambitions than working on the farm. And you think, what are my options? And then you see a newspaper flyer or, or something or an advert of gold. There's gold and wealth to be made in the Yukon. You can go up there and, and any, a young man that, that's brave and courageous is able to go up there and possibly make his fortune completely change his whole world and the future of his family, if he could strike it rich. You, know, you can see why so many men grabbed onto that. And the same thing happened uh, during the gold rush. The same thing got out, that there was gold in them, their hills. There was an opportunity, a very, very rare, a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to change your, your lot in life. 
you know, there weren't that many options, not like today. So these men were willing to do this and to endure these hardships. So the Hudson Bay Trading Company was basically a jump-off point for men that were seeking adventure and seeking wealth and fortune in the Northern Territories, largely unexplored, either through land speculation, there was some of that, um, but natural resources, really. It was either the fur trade or potentially striking gold. So they would find themselves up there, save their money, and there was everything that they needed to buy. It was basically a full outfitter store there. And so they'd buy, I need a hatchet, and I need a wall tent, and I need 15 pounds of salt, and I need uh, 20 pounds of dried beef, you know, you get the whole thing, right? So you buy all this stuff, you came from the plains of Can Can Kansas, you've never operated or worked in the mountains before. You think you know what you need. You're going off the recommendations from the clerk that may or may not be in your best interest. But how they really proved their systems out was the Hudson Bay start. So you would gather all your equipment together, you're ready to go, and then you would set out to the north one day's journey away from the, the facility. And you'd set up your entire camp and you'd spend some time there. Maybe you spend a week there. And you spend enough time go through the cycles of life, everything that you are going to be doing up there, and you quickly find, oh no, I forgot whatever. I forgot black powder for my musket. I forgot a sharpening stone for my tomahawk. I forgot um, paraffin wax uh, to waterproof my whatever, right? So then you made a list of those things. You go back south, back to the trading company, and then you provision yourself with the things that you forgot and you left. And that's the way it was done. And then they knew they could go on and, and have the things that they need because they, they utilize this the Hudson Bay start. So the same thing goes with these preparations. You think you've got your retrieval kit together. You think you've got everything in your kit you're gonna need, your winch controller, your snatch blocks, you got your soft straps, you got an extra, you know, what? You go up in the snow and throw, start using that stuff and you'll find out really quickly what it is that you thought you what it is that you forgot. You, you know, you learn by doing, by using these things. So that really is the best way to test it. I, I, I don't think I have anything to tell you that you don't already know. You've already got a year of food. You've already got a lot of liquid cash, silver, firearms, all those sorts of things. You're no, not a dummy. You're not new to this, obviously. A man that's got a year's worth of food is, no, is not new to the game. What you need to do is test your, what you already have in place. And I would do that by... Involve your whole family, make it fun, have a reward at the end of it so everyone has something to look forward to when they're enduring the hardship um, and throw that breaker and see, you'll see really quickly what's what. That's what I'd recommend. But good job, happy little accidents, man. Good for you. I would, I, I would even, I'll, uh, as a little bonus, I'm going to rate your Proho. I'm going to give you... Because you live in South Carolina, that's not ideal because it's not North Carolina, which is officially a West Coast state. But you are connected by a border, so that does a little bit of that will rub off on you. Um, my concern about South Carolina is the cities are going to empty out into you. South Carolina and North Carolina are going to absorb all of the all of the the myriad East Coast man. And if you don't, if you you think East Coast man is bad. Just wait till you get 10 East Coast men. Then you really have a problem. So I would say that's going to hold you back a little bit, but I'm going to give Happy Little Accidents an 8.5. I'm going to rate my Proho, primarily because of his location. Thanks, brother. American Dude, shout out to you, writes, Best survival book is the King James. <laughs> Thank you, Cody. Yep, there you go. The good book. That's what, they, they don't call it the good book for nothing. Yep, it is. It is. If you had nothing else... The King James Bible. Yeah. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. I think it's time to get back to the old ways. I, I used to be sympathetic to people that would say, Oh, the King James, it's, I don't understand. The language is too hard. You know, I'm going to just... I, I, it, that's too much for me as a grown man. I can't, I can't read the King James Bible. You need to grow up. Proho reads the King James Bible. Not because that's the only Bible in the world but because a little bit more tradition wouldn't hurt us at all, wouldn't it? Would it? Wouldn't it? Wouldn't you like to have a little culture? You know, this is one, the King James is one of the few things that we can cling, cling to that's actually 
somewhat of our culture as a Protestant. And finally, we have a member message from Sinkable Might 111. Shout out to you, writes, I just wanted to say thank you for your wisdom and positivity. I've taken a look at my own life and I've gotten a lot of, figured out. Thank you to you. I appreciate that very, very much. It is true. It is true. You know, guys, there's really, we over, the world is overcomplicated our life. We really don't need that much. When I used to spend the two weeks up in the elk hunting camp, when I think back on those times and how happy those times were and how much I enjoyed that and how the quality of life was so good even though we had so little, you wouldn't think that the quality of life was, is all that great when you move out of a big comfortable house with all of your things and you, my Atari video game and my race car bed and all my stuff and my BMX bike and to move up into the middle of nowhere with no power, no running water with an outhouse, a privy as my granddad used to call it, hole in the ground, a wall tent full of a bunch of stinking men eating pancakes and bacon for two weeks in minus 10, minus 20 degree weather, getting up at 3 a.m., walking around in the snow. There was very little that we were required. Everything that we, that we, or that we needed, everything that we needed to sustain us was carried in the back of a pickup. It was actually a relatively small amount of equipment. And yet I've never remembered having a better time, a, a more peaceful, joyful. I've never remembered being more content than in that environment with very, very few things. No computer, no phone, just the company of other men working together for a common goal where everyone depended upon one another and everyone trusted one another and you want to know the interesting thing about that? I just know, that I just realized that there were never any women there. <laughs> there were never any women there. Maybe that's why it was so simple. Can you imagine? Let me ask you. I'll, I'll just. I'm going to close with this. I'm going to. I'm going to propose a scenario to you guys. An austere, difficult environment, but I want you, when I'm done giving this scenario, I want you to vote in the chat with sevens if you would actually prefer this over your current status in life. Now, with this being said, I'm going to say that your family, your loved ones are, are still there in this environment, but let me paint the scenario and tell me. You, let me know in sevens if you would take this over what you're currently living with your phones and your computers and all your modern conveniences. You're living, you're, road, you're, you're, you're wandering back and forth, moving with the buffalo across the great plains of America before the white man came here. You uh, are, uh, have a brotherhood of fellow um, braves uh, who you've grown up with, known your whole life, that there is no real dishonesty in the group. Um, that you trust everyone with your life implicitly, uh, that these are all like brothers to you, and your ambition and motivation for life is to get up in the morning and to counsel together with the chief and the leaders of the group of how the buffalo hunt is going to go. <laughs> and that's your only concern. Your family is at home uh, or back uh, with, the, with the teepees and uh, the women are doing the berries and, and mending of the garments and chewing the leather, taking care of the kids, keeping the camp occupied and such. And your job is to go out and you have every day an opportunity to test your courage and bravery in the fellowship of other brave and courageous men. That you have the ability every day, if you show particular resolve or courage in a hunt or a fight or a battle of some sort, uh, to be a hero, uh, to come back uh, to receive the admiration, or the there's always the risk of uh, the condemnation if you don't act accordingly um, of your women and the tribe uh, and your fellow men. And you don't have a care in the world, you're living on the edge, life is not guaranteed to you, personal safety is not guaranteed to you, but you'll be living 
as a man should live, a free man with no one telling you what you can do or can't do. Would you prefer this if you had the opportunity to snap your fingers and to shed this mortal coil of a life that we live here now and go back to that, a simpler, cleaner life where you could be the man that you'd want to be? Um, would you exchange it? Would you have to think about it? I've already thought about it. I would take it in a heartbeat. I would take it in a heartbeat. That's why... That's why I was five hours up on my motorcycle by myself on a solo ride, pushing myself to my absolute limits yesterday. Because for a brief moment, for three, four, five hours, there's nothing going on in my life. There's nothing, there's not a care in my head. I don't, I'm not worried about my YouTube channel. I'm not worried about the live stream. I'm not worried about anything other than 100% absolute focus on what's in front of me. Do you know what I say in my mind as I'm riding over my head faster than I should be riding? When, 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 when you get in the zone and the flow and, and you just feel like, you, you just feel like you, you're transcending, like you're on another plane, there's not a thought in my mind. I keep myself on focus. I say or repeat one word in my mind, processing. Processing. As I'm looking. It's, there's no room for error on a mountain road where there's a cliff. There's no room for error at those speeds. There's no, I cannot, I don't have time to bring a worry or a care or a concern into my brain. If that distracts me from missing a rut or something hidden in the shadows or blowing a corner at 60 that I run off the edge and over a 300 foot cliff. There's just no room for error. I cannot afford to have anything come into my mind. And so I've trained myself my only, 100% of my focus is on what is in front of me, my body position, my balance, my throttle control, my clutch, the grip of the tires, what's in the shadows, what's going on is focused on the task at hand for hour after hour after hour and it's, it's exhilarating and it reminds me, it, it, it's, what it, it's what it means to live. And you know, no one knows I don't, I don't talk about this to friends. I'm not bragging about this. There's guys that are way faster than me. But this is as, this is my, this is as fast as I can go. This, this is my, this is, I'm doing the best that I can do in that environment. And to be able to be able to go up there for two or three or four hours and be a hero and to be as brave as I know how to be and, and to exercise as much courage as I know how to exercise on a personal odyssey and the only thing in my mind is, is dealing with making decisions of what's coming at me at 60, 70 miles an hour and the only thing I can think of to say in my mind is I'm processing. Processing. I'm processing an tr incredi incredible amount of data, information, adjusting throttle, adjusting balance, adjusting grip, traction, everything. It completely consumes me. It's all that I can think about and it's, and it's an entire escape from all of the complexity, and all the things in life that sucks. And it's the most therapeutic thing I know how, uh, uh, that, a, the guy can, that I know how to do. Uh, other guys, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not the only one. There, there's something special about motorcycle. When you get, to, when you get, when you get into mo this level of motorcycling, when you start to be able to experience this, th then you realize what the attraction is. This is beyond recreation. This is just beyond just another hobby. This is, this is the only thing I have to be, this is the only test of, of masculinity. The only, th this is my buffalo hunt. This is my, uh, this is my war. This is my ability to test my courage my strength and my and to conquer my fears. 
And this is, that's why I do it. You know, and that's just something that women can just nev never understand. You know, my, Mrs. W thinks it's foolish, I would imagine. She doesn't say as much. You know, she's, if she has these opinions and ideas, she keeps them to herself. But these are the type of, these are the things that I, I believe she probably thinks is, is crazy and irresponsible. And she's had to nurse me through the last couple accidents. And that puts a burden on her. But she's also smart, smart enough to understand that if I didn't have the ability to do that, to test myself and, and to push myself and to, and to live like a free man, even for a short time, true, to experience true freedom, then I wouldn't be worth having. I wouldn't be the man that she married and the man that she wants to have as a, as a mate and a husband. So it's just the, uh, just the way that we're made. We're just made differently. So the point of this story, beloved, is if you're not doing something that pushes you and challenges you as a man, that makes you appreciate the preciousness of life and the serious consequences of life, then are you really living? I wish we could do it all the time. It's probably good that we can't. We probably wouldn't live to see 50, but whatever it is that you need to do, whatever it it is that scares you that you can conquer, um, you need to make that a, a priority in your life so that you can be, so that you can be a man. That's how men, we test one another. That's how we, that's how we, that's how we do it. I, I love the motorcycles and the dual sport is achievable and attainable for most guys. And if you are missing that element in your life, um, that might be an option for you. That's why I'm always promoting it. I think it's, I think it's fabulous. I'll take some of you out with me. The roads are starting to clear up, actually. I'll close with this. If you are in the... You, you, if you live close to me, you probably know. Uh, email me if you are a... If, if this resonates with you, and if you have the capabilities and the skill set, you can do this. I will definitely organize some group rides. I would love to share... I'd love to share this. With, with people because it's pretty extraordinary. All right. Thank you, beloved. I sure do appreciate all of you guys' time, all of our, our moderators. Goodness, we had, uh, I wanted to see here, we had a $500, uh, get myself ordered. We had a $500 super chat from our friend David Hale. Thank you, David. That was incredibly incredibly generous. I sure appreciate that and a very good comment as well. It was very insightful. T treat, t tending to treat God as a first responder is something that I will think about a lot over the, maybe I'll always remember it. I think that was a quite, quite an interesting comment. All right, beloved, keep me in your prayers. May God bless you and your families. Don't forget, stock up tonight, eat up, have a double dinner tonight. Our fasting, our week three starts tomorrow and after that we'll have one more week and then we're done. And that'll be 24 hours. So I will be there doing it with you. Get close to God. Get right with your Father. And pray for me. We'll see you guys. We'll see you guys over on the next video.